This is Ichari Bacho d e an Okinawan Voices and Stories podcast, episode three, part one on Hajichi. Hi, Sai Gusio. Hajimiti ya Sai. One name Mariko Yairin. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Mariko. Welcome to Ichari Bacho d e a podcast featuring Okinawan voices and stories. In this podcast, we aim to create an open and safe learning and growing space where we will explore alongside guest speakers what it means to be Shimanshu. Our intention and prayer for this project is to cultivate our own knowledge about our histories, celebrate the amazingly diverse and resilient culture of our people, inspire other Shimanshu of all generations and geographic locations to be curious about their histories, and to preserve those precious pieces of our identity for future generations. And of course, to have fun along the way. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll stumble around and be human. We hope you will join us for this evolving journey together. We are looking forward to it. Yutasuru gutsu, unige sabira. Welcome to episode three of the Ichari Ba Chode podcast. One name Mariko Yaibin. My name is Mariko, and today I'll be your co host, Yutashiku. I'm here with guest speakers Ko Lewis. Hi. Jun Owatari. Hello. And Hilson Reed Path. Hi. And we are going to talk about a topic that has been deeply intriguing to so many people of the Shimanshu community and beyond. But before we get started, I'd love to share a little bit about our guests. Ko is a second generation mixed American Shimanshu from her Obachan, who immigrated to the US in the 50s. Her interest in Hajichi is heavily focused on decolonizing available resources on authentic practice history and a desire to see Hajichi revived and incorporated into modern Shimanshu culture. She is part of the group behind the new Shimanshu Hajichi Revival Project, collecting contemporary and historic family stories of Hajichi and multilingual Hajichi resources for Shimanshu exploring Hajichi. Ko is based in New York City, where she attends medical school. June is a child of immigrants between a Japanese father and an Okinawan mother. Their grandmother was born and raised in Tenian, infamously where the Enola Gay flew from. June's interest in DIY and stick and poke tattoos and their place in niche communities was peaked several years ago, despite their mother and grandmother's vehement objections. And because of their objections, was so excited and intrigued to learn that there is actually an Okinawan tradition of tattooing. In their professional life, June is a massage therapist and body worker, tarot mentor, and writer. Hilson is a PhD candidate in East Asian languages and literatures at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. While Hilson does not identify as Shimanshu or Japanese in any capacity, in fact, his mother is from Peru and his father is from Buffalo, New York, his love of the islands and culture developed through a visit to Okinawa while studying abroad and then subsequently deepened while living in Miyakojima for three years teaching English. Hajichi is a phenomenon that has circled around him since, and he became interested in Okinawa as it makes appearances in literature, but it wasn't until he found the documentary he's currently working on, Afterglow of the Southern Islands, that he really began to see Hajichi as a way to think through a lot of issues regarding identity, gender, economics, et cetera, in modern Okinawa. Wow. What an amazingly diverse panel. And did I get all of that right? Perfect on my end. That's a mouth, mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write a shorter one next time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We have incredible panelists. We're so excited to, to bring you all on. You're representing such different.、Um, Lenses through which to approach Hajichi. So I'm super excited to see where this conversation goes. And we've got some amazing questions that we've come up with in advance, but I think we're also going to take it sort of ad lib and see what happens organically. So I'll go ahead and kick it off with our first question,、um, which is What is your relationship to Hajichi? 
What does it represent or mean to you? And how did you become interested and what sparked your curiosity around it? I feel like Ko should go first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me give this one a stab. So I think important context is that I don't have Hajichi presently. It's something I would like to get in the future, but it's something I want to be really intentional about. And it's particularly important to me to have a, the right practitioner to get Hajichi. And so what I've been spending a lot of my time doing is looking at who the individuals are who call themselves Hajichiya, Hajichi practitioners. Uh, and what their work looks like, what it embodies, and getting a feel for the various ways that people are recreating Hajichi today. For me, personally, or I guess I could say that I just have a lot of tattoos. I like hit the legal age for tattoos <laughs> and sprinted my way into the worst tattoo shop, got the worst tattoo I could get, left in the middle of it, was so upset at the tattoo artist, <laughs> and then just kept going. Um, and so... When I finally got to the point where I slowed down, I wanted to reflect on what why I was getting tattoos. Because I would leave. If, you hear this a lot from people with lots of tattoos, at least I do, that like the more you get them, the worse they hurt. <laughs> and it's sort of this like emotional blindness that you have to the pain of tattoos. And you go and you're like, oh yeah, that's the worst. <laughs> and I would leave tattoo sessions and just think like, why am I doing this to myself? Why is it meaningful mm -hmm. to me that I keep making these permanent marks on my body? And then it just got a little too deep. And I was like, wait, really, why is this meaningful to me? Why is it important? Like, I know tattoos are part of my heritage and history. They're part of the heritage and history of the world. And we've lost so much of that. And is there any connection for me in, in that history? And it has become something I want to unpack. So <laughs> if I get more tattoos in my life, or when I do, I want them to be connected to this, this deeper meaning. And Hajichi just has such a beautiful kind of lifelong growth, or at least it mm. did. And that's something that is not yet being recreated, at least in what I've explored and encountered. So the idea of getting them piecemeal throughout your life through milestones. Mm. Uh, and that practice is something that I'm I'm just particularly interested in seeing recreated, obviously in a different way, because we can't give five-year-olds tiny finger tattoos <laughs> and then give them to you at puberty and give them to you at at possibly preteen marriage. So <laughs> there's, it will just be so different in whatever it is today without even getting into the whole gender component of it. And that's kind of where I find myself most interested in and focused. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> can I ask, can I ask a follow-up question? Cause you had mentioned wanting to find the right practitioner if you wanted to get Hajichi and what, what would be the right practitioner for you or like Good what would be the criteria or the definition? Yeah, this is a, something I've been wrestling with a lot because like you don't get to create that person, right? They pre-exist for you. You come to them, they find you, you find them. Um, so my hajichiya, my person who makes my hajichi won't be the person that I envision them being essentially they're, they're going to be their own individual who's recreated this practice for or revived, created, makes this practice something of their own. Um, I want someone who has like a philosophical alignment with me, or at least in this component of their life, their practice aligns with me on, on why they're revitalizing it, how they want to see it live in the world. I'd like someone who's invested in bringing Hajichi back to Shimachu, back to Okinawans or Ryukyuans specifically, rather than just recreating it as a practice, which is certainly the way that some people are approaching it. But I, I find myself leaning as well to individuals who are more focused on the traditional imagery of Hajichi, because I've seen that lots of folks use the word Hajichi for things that don't embody that original imagery. And this is like its own kind of conversation that I think mm. we could get into. But like, what makes a piece Hajichi? Is it yeah. hand tattoos specifically? Is it tattoos? Is it tattoos done with like an intent to pass on our culture? Where does the line get drawn? And while I am very for the change of visual hajichi in the future, there's a part of me that does want to see this kind of like purest or more traditional imagery mm -hmm. of hajichi brought back and reincorporated. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to sound so essentialist there. I do see a lot of room for alternative change and movement in it. 
I think that's enough of me rambling though. Don't <laughs> Amazing. I love it. It's my fault. I did ask. <laughs> That's great. No, I appreciate all of the questions. I feel like the listeners out there are, are having similar questions, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm just so delighted. This is our first panel. Um, we've had one guest speaker before you all, but this is like a really organic sort of Petri dish of people with, again, a huge range of backgrounds that you're approaching the Hajiji from. Um and I love that you, Ko, that you were speaking about your your personal experience. I'm curious, June or Hilson, if you either of you have tattoos um, and what your relationship is to Hajiji or tattooing practice in general. Uh, well, like I said in the, or like you read from my bio, <laughs> I do have a bunch of tattoos. I started off with uh, two finger tattoos, actually, not even knowing anything about uh, like the Okinawan tradition of Hajiji, mm. like. So I just like went straight for the hand um, <laughs> Bold. and I did it. <laughs> yeah. And it was my first tattoo. I was like, just finished living by myself for the first time. Like I'd lived outside of my family, but it was my first time living solo. And I was just moving out of that apartment to move back in with some people. And it was just, kind of, and it was my birthday. So it was like this very like transitional time. And it was just finally felt right to get tattoos and having mm-hmm. that be my first tattoo and then learning about how the tradition of Hajuchi is about like kind of different points of your life mm. kind of like it, not kind of, it really resonated with me. Which fingers did you get tattooed when you got a couple fingers uh, done? These, these guys. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, index finger, and middle finger, and they're um, a question mark on the index and an exclamation point on the middle finger. So I could flip people off if mm-hmm. I want. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. So I asked because a lot of what I've read has referenced the first tattoos for little girls being their um these two fingers, middle finger and ring finger oh, are okay. like two little dots that slowly get expanded between I can't lift just those two fingers. I can. <laughs> so they would have just these two. Uh but yeah, I also have um I've only had one studio tattoo. I've only ever done tattoos in my friends' living rooms, on their porch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. it's always been this kind of group or friend um, activity to tattoo each other. Mm-hmm. And I, I really liked that idea in Hajuchi as well when I was learning more about, like, oh, it's just, you know, community members tattooing each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you, June. Yeah. I love that. Um, Hillson, would you like to share it all? I'm curious. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't have any tattoos, uh, <laughs> I'm rather <laughs> drab in that regard. Um, yeah, you know, like, I, like you said, uh, when you introduced me, um, you know, I'm not, I don't really, I don't identify, um, as Shimanchu or anything like that. My interests to, to Okinawa and, um, to, to Hajichi, uh, sort of as an extension or something that have, you know, grown, uh, just sort of grown over the past, well, Okinawa started 15 years ago, maybe when I just wow. visited on a whim and then, um, Hajichi specifically. So, you know, I, I'm in this East Asian languages and literatures department at UH Manoa, ostensibly my degree is in Japanese literature, but really my, my research, my dissertation, everything is about Okinawa and Okinawan identity and, and really more like this period of, you know, the early 20th century. Uh, so, at the sort of beginnings of the idea of Okinawa prefecture as a as a place and, and what that means. And I'm really interested in thinking about, you know, how we go from Ryukyu or Luchu to Okinawa and what does that mean to the people at this time? And how is it more specifically, because I study literature and, and media and things, how is that, how are, how are those things sort of come out in practice of, of, of literary arts and things like that? So I found Hajichi, um, you know, I, I've worked on poets and things like that, and, and and short stories, and and you, I would always hear sort of references uh, to hand tattoos. It's something that would be mentioned. Like for example, there's this very perhaps the most famous Okinawan poet. Uh, his name is Yamano Kuchibaku, who's a really interesting guy, and perhaps his, one of his most famous poems is this one that's called "A Conversation," which is sort of this. Um, recreated conversation between a man, presumably Baku, this um, man living in Tokyo uh, or outside of Okinawa and a woman who's asking, where are you from? Who are you? What is, what, where are you from? Like these sort of casually innocent questions, but internally he answers that all these sort of repeating um, 
Okinawan stereotypes. And this was written mm-hmm. in the 30s. And he says something. Uh, he says, um, my homeland, uh, I lit a cigarette and thought that place colored by the associations of tattooed hands and uh, jabi sens or sanchens that are like a pattern of customs. Is that my homeland? So like, this is just one little link. We see, you know, him talking mm-hmm. about um, tattooed hands. It comes up in other short stories. And then I was lucky to find reference through YouTube. I don't even know how I found this. Someone put a trailer up of this documentary that I've been working on mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. That's It's literally a minute of it. And I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, what is this? And it's this documentary from the 80s. Uh, we can get into what it what it's all about. Basically, it's just been sort of a, my, my interest in, in uh, Hajiji is just a, a snowball that continues to grow. And the more and more I dig mm-hmm. into it, the more and more I see connections and its reference and, and trying to think about what it means and its significance uh, for, for, you know, Okinawans in the, in this, during this time period. So, you know, I come at it, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm interested in research and I'm coming at it sort of objectively, I guess, right. I don't have this sort of subjective connection. Like it's not part of my culture or my heritage. So I try, I try and come at it with, you know, compassion and respect uh, for what it is mm-hmm. um, and what it means to, to different people. But it is, I think, a lens through which we can try and open up conversations about other issues that were impacting um, Okinawans at this time. Wow. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for sharing. I think you you hit on a lot of really important points too. Of just how how much I think the piece that I'm I'm coming away with, like how how much the 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 tattoo, you know, like you have the question of the identity, right? This this guy asking, like, what does it mean? And there's like this internal dialogue, and and there are these visuals of culture, but whether it be the sanshin or the tattoo or what have you, as being you know icons of what does it mean to be Shimanchu or Okinawan, and um, the idea of the tattoo growing. To too, is sort of like kind of, kind of what you were talking about, Co, about how it starts as a little, you know, like young, young women mm-hmm. would have like it, as, you know, as a little dot, and then it would slowly grow. And, you know, I wonder what that, what that means, like, in sort of like the larger metaphorical context of, um, of our studies as it is now, and what does it grow? Like, how does this create like of a, um, like a cultural revival? And I think we'll get there, but I, yeah, I would love to dive in um, the, the two pieces, like the two halves of this segment that I was thinking we could focus on the historical and then maybe we could move um, sort of the vision, the revival and that kind of thing while we have everybody here for the historical piece. Marco, while you look at that, Hilton, yeah. I wanted to, in the poem that you're speaking about or the piece you're speaking about, it's such a passing reference to Hajichi. And I found in trying to research the history of it that that is so often the case, kind of twofold, either outsiders coming in and they see Hajichi and it's this comment of like, oh God, and the women do this barbaric thing to themselves. And then they go on and it's not explored. Um, or on the flip side, it's Okinawans Rukyuns themselves mentioning it as a characteristic of their history. And again, moving on just, oh yeah, that's there. Right. And let's get away from it mm-hmm. and keep going with our other pieces. And so I just find that really interesting. And one thing this sort of, and doesn't necessarily segue with it, but when I first started trying to research Hajichi, what you find is that almost all of these resources are written from an outsider perspective. And part of me is like, well, this is garbage, throw it out. I'm over it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find the Mm -hmm. real history. I'm going to dig it out and it's going to be there somewhere. And in a way it is, there's interviews, like the piece you're translating now is women speaking for themselves about their experience. But even those women are almost exclusively getting their tattoos after Japan has implemented a ban. And so their expense, which I'd love if you could speak to, but Mariko and I met with another revival or kind of continuation tattoo practitioner. And she was talking about how you can really decolonize these pieces as you read through them and pull out your history if you take it with the right approach and and put that decolonizing lens onto the piece. And I've just really appreciated that as I go through all these pieces, like trying to parse out the history when it's buried between layers of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's um, it's, I think it's a great observation to sort of think about the historically right um and so i should maybe just preface like when i say when i'm talking about historically like i'm i'm really sort of honing in on like i always say sort of pre-war but like it is really like personally my a lot of my my knowledge base is is coming from writing or documents or things like that that are or lived experiences rather that were coming out in that documentary from like the 1900 to the 30s roughly right um which is a tumultuous time and you know one thing i think to sort of speak to the what you were mentioning about like when Okinawans are 
are themselves discussing this or when they're making reference to it. I mean, we can't go, we can't go through the whole poem, I think, but Baku is one of the reasons I'm interested in this, this man, this figure is because he represents a lot of the internal struggles of, yes, he references it. And it could be read as displacing of the idea of it, or that's just part of us, but he's really seemed to toil with, it is part of me, but I'm also supposed to not be that as well, right? Like I can't, Mm -hmm. I can't separate that from myself. And, and it's, this also comes into play when you see um, there's a there's her example there's a, a short story by a female writer one of the few female voices that we have like contemporary of this time her name is uh, Kushi Kushi Fusako was her name and she wrote a story um, that was called um, it's been translated as Memoirs of a Declining Ryukyuan Woman and there's a there's an English translation of this story that's pretty easy to find in the anthology of Okinawan literature called Southern Exposure. And one of the things that she she brings it up almost in the first paragraph. She mentions that she had a friend that was living in Okinawa that wanted to move to Tokyo, wanted to move her family to Tokyo because at the time in the 20s, it was a very tough time economically, but that the tattoos are referenced as a problem at this time, right? As something that mm-hmm. um, because of the immediate sort of visual nature of them, she can't move her mother from Okinawa to, to Tokyo because they'll face discrimination and, and difficulties finding a job and things like that. But I think this is in the 30s. And then if we look back at um, just a, a generation or two beforehand, right, when you were mentioning like young girls getting the tattoos as markers of you know development and life and stages, and this is something to be celebrated, right? Just probably you know, 30, 40, 50 years beforehand, this was an exciting part and, and an integral part of a, of a woman's life in, in Ryukyu. And here we have just such a short time later, this Okinawa woman talking about the difficulties of what, what the sort of traditions can bring to uh, Okinawans in modern Japan. It, it's, just, it's such a, a nuanced and complicated uh, thing. And the nature, one of the things that I'm interested is the nature of tattoos being something that are permanent right it's it's this marking mm-hmm. in the most literal sense that you can't you can't take off your you know you can take off your clothes you can put on you can stop wearing you know uh traditional okinawan uh joyu or kimonos and, and wear western clothes and sort of work that but you can't you can't remove these from your hands so what happens is uh generational differences or things that appear and yeah i, I don't know exactly but i think it's mm-hmm. it's, it's a really interesting uh observation no, absolutely. I love that. There are two things that I made me think of that I just want to say. And one is for listeners that the ban was placed in 1899 is the time I have. Does that match everybody else's? Yeah, yeah 1899. Yeah. Right. And then as far as like tattoo, I guess two things, tattoo removal, there are stories of girls trying to burn their tattoos off with acid. So I think like the extent to which people tried to reverse this irreversible thing is just something I think that we in our generation need to make space for and honor as well. There's like this drive in me to like, go, go, get hajiji, get tattoo. But the cost of a tattoo is eternal. Like you're saying, you have it forever. It's it's mm-hmm. quite enormous. And for a, a place as prominent as the hands, it really is a, a very large decision for people to do. So these women who post this ban in this 30 year period, who were getting these tattoos, their full hands in secret and hiding, we're making an, a sacrifice in a way, making a really large sacrifice, taking an enormous risk. Like I, I hear people sharing that their families would say, oh, they're going to, Japanese are going to cut your hand off if you get them. Not that I have also seen that in any kind of evidenced way, but it was mm-hmm. like the, the threat that was thrown around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I read that one story of a whole group of schoolgirls using acid to burn the tattoos off of their hands as well. Um, and then there's the, I don't want to say fiction, but the legend behind Hajichi, like what is the story of Hajichi? And the one that I've heard in in multiple kind of slight iterations is that there was a woman of renown, often a priestess, who an outsider wanted to take as a bride or as a courtesan. And so she tattooed her hands with Hajichi so that he wouldn't take her away. And so there's this idea that Hajichi protected you from being taken off the island. And then when Okinawa fell into famine and such economic distress, Mm -hmm. they did exactly that. They trapped these women on this island that had been ravaged by a colonizing force. And so it's just this Mm -hmm. two sides of a coin that are both so noteworthy, I suppose. That's all. That's Mm -hmm. all I'm going with there. I think they're just really important things to recognize and think about. Well, just that flip between it being something, Hajichi being something 
freeing almost and like so like cultural and uh, mm-hmm. core to identity and then having it be like the chains that mm-hmm. kept us there. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I've heard stories too of women who had immigrated away being sent back after they got somewhere, after they kind of go through whatever the border screening process is and their hajichi were seen and then they'd be sent back. And I'm sure so many people will have the same stories of seeing photos of their ancestors. Mm-hmm. Somebody's just got on these odd black gloves. You know, there's always mm-hmm. the like old Oba sitting in the front. And mm-hmm. She's either got her palms up or she's in black gloves. Uh, and so often those are hiding hajichi. Yeah. And, and, you know, to this note, one thing I would, I would say is that these two sort of um, ways of thinking about Hajiji, right, is something that was live and an and, and act of, you know, something to celebrate versus something to be restricted. And then also uh, something that would keep you home. And that's what you wanted to do, right? This sort of protection um, uh, versus uh, something that would trap you. In many ways, and depending on the sort of person that you're talking to, uh, and I'm going. I'm I'm uh, using this documentary that I've been working to try and translate as evident. You know, my sort of my case study for this is, it's it's within a couple years, ten years. Mm-hmm. So even at the same time, you have perhaps uh, one girl, a young girl whose parents have them um, get the tattoos in a in a rush and uh, not understanding what what is really happening to them, right? In this documentary and through my research, you know, the the practice really continues for a few years after the 1899 law is passed, but it, it goes into hiding, right? It goes into secret. And then within a couple of decades, it's really quite suppressed. So in the teens, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, you have these tattoos that are given to young girls and they don't really understand they they say like I don't I don't know what this means right the Okinawan the local Okinawan he's a cultural historian in Okinawa that helps the filmmaker from Tokyo and he's asking them he points to the tattoos on their hands he said well what is this what do you call this uh, you know what is the name of this you know symbol or this pattern and many of them don't know um, oh I don't know that's or or, or they they. I don't want to say misidentified, but you know, he, he seems to have a lot of, he's done this a lot and he says, well, I think it's actually called this or whatever. (laughs) And, and, um, and then, oh, okay, maybe. Right. And well, why did you get this? You know, like some of them aren't able to do that. And it, and it just seems to say that like, that was this, it signals that this was this moment where so much of the history behind it gets lost in this moment of acting to try and protect someone. And, and in fact, one of the women interviewed says, um, they said that if I didn't get them, they would take me away to China. And I didn't want to be taken away, right? So, like, this was this in China. Of course, we see like the early um, further developments of uh, Japanese colonial expansion and that and that threat there. Um, and then, on the flip side, there are women also who still still have like a great memory and great pride in what this is. And they talk about one of the this. There's this one woman who's uh, 14 when she got hers done, and she was so excited about it. And she talks, she says, like, I was so happy after I got it done. It was as though I was married, even though I wasn't, right? Like mm-hmm. this, this was, you know, mm-hmm. I got the ones and I was so happy. And she she talks about how she wanted to walk down the street, like waving her hands side to side to sort of really show these mm-hmm. off. And she's still in 1984 talking mm-hmm. so happy and 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 you know about this. And so I, I guess it's just like you see such a dynamic um you know, it means different things to different people and to, and, and, and I, you know, I don't want to go too far with conjecture, but we also might see that the degrees to which um, different individuals are maintaining um, the sort of larger connections with, with other traditions versus like sort of the, the wave of of modernity sort of sweeping some, you know, coming in and and can be difficult to, things can get forgotten or, or, or not transmitted in the process. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I love I love that. Um yeah, and I'm curious, I've been I've been thinking sort of as things evolve. Um one question I have is, you know, as as we all know, Okinawa is occupied by a large US military force. And um yeah, what do you feel the influence of American culture has done? Um, to to Hajichi? I mean, we sort of like looked back, we've kind of like looked mm-hmm. backwards, right? And you know, you know, there's two sides there and then you have the individual, which is a whole complex layer of why am I doing this? And why am I not? Or, you know, the rationale behind it. And then you add these layers of, you know, colonization and then double colonization. And, and, and so how do you, how do you feel that has impacted either Hajichi 
like retrospectively or moving forward the current the current population and then maybe even beyond that to the diaspora um well i guess we'll get to the diaspora with the revival but yeah <laughs> So I guess for context, my father was a serviceman. So we were stationed in Okinawa for a couple years of my high school time. Um, and my mother's family is still there. So I also have family on the island. Uh, but similarly, my grandmother also married a Marine stationed in Okinawa. So it's like two generations of kind of Okinawan American service member relationships. And I think it's won't surprise anyone to know that that dynamic is incredibly hostile on the island the american mm -hmm. presence and the local community plenty of the local community work on the basis and are appreciative of the benefits that come from it so you know there it's a very nuanced impression and understanding it's not so simple as as kind of a black and white relationship and i think that's important to recognize as well clearly many people marry between those lines and that's a good indicator itself but and this is changing as well, but the American service community is very heavily tattooed, or at least was when I was a teenager. Uh, and they were pretty visible at the time as well. But I believe that is being regulated to some extent. And on the island, there were parts of the island where you would go in and it was just like, no, we're not doing that. We're not having the American look and we're not having the Americans in. So like my family would go to onsen together like on a regular basis. And the onsen we went to was one of the like no tattoos, but like everywhere. And not they wouldn't let Americans in with them either. It was like, and in a way, it was to keep it as a local space. So it was one one of the onsen that we would go to where we'd just never see any foreigners. It was always Okinawans. And so it was kind of protective in that way because this was a way to identify another without saying we don't allow Americans mm -hmm. and causing themselves strife. Oh, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> right. And so when I got yeah. tattoos, my first tattoo, that was like my biggest hang up was like, I'm not going to be able to go into my old family onsen if I go back to Okinawa. But that's changing in, in Japan and in Okinawa now. So who knows? Maybe I'll get to go into an onsen. <laughs> I think also I I was really into like the punk scene in Okinawa and like my favorite band Roach would like play in different places around the island. And I would see okay, what? people. <laughs> I love <Sound>. this. <laughs> There's a punk but... scene. I'm down. Yeah, there is. There totally yeah. is an Okia and for sure. Uh, and a lot of those people have tattoos and there's like a bleed of like American kind of fusion style tattoos as well. Mm. But I feel like the imagery definitely shows the significant American influence. Mm -hmm. um, Hilson, if you're familiar with that kind of bleed, do you want to talk to it? So, so the suppression of, of Hajichi is one of many a sort of part of a multifaceted effort by the Japanese government to, um, in one sense, you can you could say to eliminate Ryukyuan culture. I, although I wouldn't call it exactly, I wouldn't go that far because later on it's important that Japan, once it becomes a, a full-on empire, uh, demonstrates the the its multiculturalism. But um, early Okinawa is very early on in this period, so it's uh, things like I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure this podcast will get to these issues, right? Issues <laughs> of language uh, suppression. Um, being perhaps the most dominant and prominent one, and and this is just another, you know, part of that sort of multi-tier, multi-faceted uh, push on Japan's part to Japan Japanize or Japanization of Okinawa, right? To get people to buy into first, you force them, and then eventually hope that they buy into the idea of this new mm -hmm. national identity. And um, unfortunately, it was pretty successful i think in many ways in terms of like the, the yeah. suppression of the language obviously you know uh you know shimakotoba or uchinaguchi or miyakuchi wherever you're at right mm -hmm. it's very difficult it's very in a very tenuous position today and um something like tattoos were also i think it was a very successful you know they, they did a pretty good job of, of cracking down on it by um by the time the american uh, occupation begins in 1945 and one thing that i think is interesting that I don't know that it gets discussed a lot because um, we. I think we think of the U.S. occupation sort of in the most more contemporary, and it's very, you know, very problematic in a lot of ways. But one of the interesting things that happens in the early years of the occupation, through the '50s, roughly um, by the '60s, they had given up on this idea. What was there was an effort by USCAR, the Civil Administration of the UQs, the U.S. Civil Administration of the UQs, to try and embolden. Uh, 
traditional, like a view Q and pride, right? A traditional, mm-hmm. like, instillment of like, mm-hmm. no, you're not Japanese, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're, this is, you are, view Q, right? This is view Q, mm-hmm. right? And, and the, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, um, so altruistic, right? It's, it is, you know, the idea was that so that you don't go back to Japan, right? Mm-hmm. So that we can have another Guam or something like that. And, and we don't, you know, that Okinawa maintains in the, independent, uh, you know, so-called independence, um, it's a failure, uh, through and through, but part of the things, some of the efforts that do happen is there are actually like language classes that the U S administration tries to begin. And, but I don't think they go as far as tattoos. Right. So, um, <laughs> I don't think that they like encourage that certainly not 1950s <laughs> military. I can't imagine mm. that they're really, pushing that. but I, I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, the, the relationship in general, on a larger scale of the U.S. presence to sort of like traditional Ryukyuan culture or sort of indigenous culture is, I think, reflective of, of a sort of, I don't know, it's quite, it's quite hands off. It's sort of, I don't know, this sort of liberal will allow them to have it, but as long as it doesn't become like a problematic, mm-hmm. like certainly no, they're not interested in, I think, uh, uh, you know, efforts for Ryukyuan independence or anything like that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if that really answers your question. I, my, my sort of is like, I don't know that it, there was something I think it had been so sort of wiped out by the time that they arrive. Um, but I hadn't thought about, you know, Koei is really interesting to bring in, like, mm-hmm. you know, again, like a sort of more modern, you know, tattoos. Right, jumping us back up to today. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I feel like the folks I see who have hajichi nowadays are part of the kind of like alt culture in Okinawa. Um, but that is also changing as well. Like if I look at folks who got their tattoos maybe five years ago, I would say they have a very alt aesthetic, but some folks I see doing really minimalist tattooing inside of Japan and incorporating hajichi are, don't seem to embody that alternative culture. They are bringing back kind of the like pride and traditional practice. So it, it's still growing and changing. But I do think, Mariko, there is something to that question that you initially brought up of American influence for kind of like bringing this aesthetic back, mm. at least in some way. Mm-hmm. Which is also to say that, you know, pure tattooing is the only form to bring back hajichi it's not the only way that people are bringing it back now. There's lots of essentially henna, jaguar, so like mm. temporary wearing of hajichi. And I think that's something to explore, celebrate. It's something I'm excited to see because like we were saying, hand tattoos are an enormous cost. We shouldn't downplay them. We should recognize that and recognize how enormous of a decision they are. And I, I just want to see hajichi out in the world and even if that means that they're in these temporary formats for people who want to enjoy and celebrate and continue sharing them, I'm here for that. Mm-hmm. So go get yourself some Jaguar. Works great. Mm-hmm. I love that. <laughs> it is a huge commitment. Even just like thinking about like what you've said historically, it's like you literally are putting something on your body permanently that will either keep you somewhere or prevent you from going somewhere, whether it's an onsen or you're going to get sent back to the country that you came from when you know you're in the middle of like an economic hardship. And yeah, I, um, June, I'm actually, I'd love to hear from you a little bit too. Cause I mean, as somebody that actually has hand tattoos, like how do you, how do you feel like you, you know, how do you, I, identify with that sort of statement that you've made um and that process i, I have a question also for june about her hand tattoos. yeah yeah okay, I, sure. i'm curious about how <laughs> I, I leading it's a leading question but i'm curious about the the act the the sensation of the the, te- the hand te- the i'm curious about the pain and, and that sort of how how that went and and um yeah if that you know remembering what that experience was and what that sort of if that means anything okay Okay, well, uh, I don't remember what Mariko said, so I'll start with <laughs> Elsa's question. It hurts. Sorry, it sorry, hurts. sorry. Leading, it's, it's a fine. great leading question. No, 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 it fucking hurts. Am I allowed to cuss? <laughs> <laughs> we'll make this a non-children safe well, no, episode. No, no. Okay, sorry. I definitely just dropped the F-bomb, but, um, <laughs> but I don't mean to. I can totally not. Um, it can be explicit. But yeah, I'm just, I'm really bad. <laughs> Spotify will it flag It hurt a lot. My first two tattoos was done by my downstairs neighbor whose hands were shaking so hard wow. that he apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry. I did a lot of ecstasy the night before. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I still went ahead and did it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I, <laughs> so that's my first tattoo ever. 
And ever since, <laughs> it's gone, the experience of being tattooed has gone up from there. And I don't regret the tattoo <laughs> at all. <laughs> but like that didn't put me off from like getting like mm-hmm. having my friends tattoo me. Like I mm-hmm. still love the idea of having like, oh, it was my downstairs neighbor who did it. That's cool to me. Like I love mm-hmm. that. And yeah, he was living his life the best <laughs> way he wanted to, I guess. Uh, wow. And I did have to get the tattoo touched up by someone else. <laughs> and it looks a little bit better now. But um, every single hand tattoo I've gotten since then has been with my other um, tattoo artist friend, Chris. My other hand is tarot related stuff. And Mm. I do a lot of tarot and tarot means a lot to me. Like it's helped me through some really rough times. Mm -hmm. So just having someone there to like kind of signal that I'm really taking tarot seriously. Like it's like another Mm -hmm. milestone for me, for my life and having that intimate moment. Cause it was literally Mm -hmm. just him and me in the studio um, Mm -hmm. while he like tattooed me. No. Uh, even though it hurt, it hurt a lot too so it's like it's yeah. like another thing like having someone that you trust with you that you're like in pain with I have a thing about not really I mean I'm working on it now but like you know not showing pain not being vulnerable around people so it's mm-hmm. like a very mm-hmm. intimate thing mm-hmm. that's really that's really interesting I, I thank you for sharing because I mm-hmm. was I was curious because um and I pulled up this quote from this documentary and I, I need to give this woman I, she has a name I don't want her she can't be lost to history her name's Yamaguchi Ushi is someone I've been referencing a lot and she has this quote in the and he's, they ask her about the act right he asked did it hurt right um uh, the director of the film and and I have this little longer quote that I pulled up but I think it's quite interesting she says oh it hurt but I persevered and just fought the pain. None of us said that it hurt. The others did it that way. So I did too, just fought the pain. This is a pain women must suffer. There were many painful needles that pierced me. And my mother would say, there will be countless difficulties when you marry into a family. You have to endure, become a good wife and don't cause me concern. You must get through it. So I took the initiative and got the hajichi. This sort of parental teaching is bound into hajichi. So you know, like, you know, I, yeah. you know, the way she's talking about the, pe- yeah, <laughs> like, uh, it's really powerful. Oh, thank um, you for reading that for us, Wilson. Yeah. yeah oh, I got skin prickles. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it just showed to me, this quote shows how like, you know, the transgenerational um, beyond just her and her mother, but, you know, going back so many beyond like this, you know, mm-hmm. it means so many, so many things are sort of wrapped into this act of, um, of 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 the the process of doing it the material mm-hmm. connection of it to to people before you and what it means and your role in society right this is obviously like a, a kind of more much more traditional you know a woman mm-hmm. to get married and have children and the pain mm-hmm. i think like, childbirth i think is also tied into what is perhaps mm-hmm. being discussed here is like the pain that is being felt mm-hmm. so it's really intimate and and uh I don't know. I, I thought, it, and, and actually doing some of the things you were saying, it's not unlike really, like I think some mm-hmm. of the, what she's saying as well. Well, I think it's so interesting that, that there's like this other, I mean, I don't know how many times we see this narrative of women having to endure pain silently mm-hmm. and not complain. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and just like the fact that it, even like when I was talking about, like my friend got to see me in pain and I got to tell him like, i and this fucking hurts, bro. <laughs> I need a break, you know, or like, mm-hmm. like crying or like, you know, and, mm-hmm. and how I have personally worked on, I am going to show pain mm-hmm. outwardly because I don't want to be silent in pain mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. like, at, it's like such a trauma to mm-hmm. women or AFAB people that we're, it's such a common thing that we are, we're supposed to not talk about when we're hurting. Mm-hmm. So, wow. Thank you so much, June, for, for saying, saying that, that just like really struck me. And I, I think about, you know, pain is like, that's like a universal human thing, right? We all experience pain. Life is pain and we have all of these traumas and, and, and while Hilson was reading that passage, um, that quote, I'm just thinking, 
you know, like for them at that time, you know, childbirth or, you know, the, what it meant to be a woman or, you know, that was imbued into the tattoo at the time. And that was really meaningful and significant to the point they literally were putting it on their bodies, you know, you know, willingly saying, do this thing to me. I want this thing. And, you know, and even hearing your story about, about that, it's like kind of transcending, it's already morphing. Right. And you're like, I'm choosing to do this and I'm going to get these incredible like tarot symbols that are so meaningful to me. And this mark this is like a rite of passage for me where, you know, here I am being witnessed by somebody that's close to me in this like powerful ceremonial place, you know, and that's really like kind of just amazing. Like that's like a huge rite of passage. Um, and just, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think I'll be thinking about that for a long time about the connection of what does it mean to, to have, to have tattoo in that way and what does that allow you to do and um, who does it allow you to talk to? I, I, I love Co that you brought in the punk scene. Cause like, I love, I don't have any tattoos, but I'm like, Oh man, I'm, I'm like, like, you know, hearkening back to my, my formative years and like, you know, hanging out in some punk circles and stuff and being mm -hmm. like, Oh, someday I'll get a tattoo. Still haven't got one. I'm like in my thirties. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like I have street cred, you know, like, you know, and, and what, it, what does that mean? You know, um, uh -huh. I don't think I would have tattoos if I hadn't been surrounded by people with them. It's, yeah. it's like a, a very passive peer pressure. And then it becomes a way that you signal as well. It's you know, signal, I can go yeah. down the street I just, and I feel I like I walk into I just remembered I was space. full on anti-tattoo. I just remembered what? that. I just remember oh. that I was full on anti-tattoo <laughs> until I got my first tattoo. And <laughs> wow. I think I like I think I remember telling my friends like, oh, yeah, I would never get a tattoo. Like, it's like a permanent mm -hmm. thing. And like, mm -hmm. well, I would like I would get sick of it so fast. And mm -hmm. I love that you like, went straight whole, to your hands after that. <laughs> yeah, straight to my hands. <laughs> But like, but I think part of it was also like, well, if I go to Japan, I won't be able to go to the onsen. I won't be able mm -hmm. to, you know, like be part of that culture. And like at the time I wasn't Okinawan, I was Japanese. So mm -hmm. Glad yeah, it's funny how like our relationships to tattoos can evolve yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like growth too. I was thinking about like, you know, as a, ch you know, like sort of as somebody ages, the tattoo grows, right. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it might've meant something at one point and then it morphs into something bigger and like you can endure more pain or it symbolizes something, you know, like some kind of skill or craft or, you know, thing that is more present in your life. And yeah, I, I'm seriously toying around with the, well, not toying, I'm seriously <laughs> considering the idea of tattooing, um, getting a tattoo, but, you know, maybe I'll do one after this. I don't think I'll go straight to my hands, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call you, June. I'll be like, I need a witness. <laughs> witness yes. me in my pain. <laughs> Um, I, one of my friends actually, um, her first tattoo, cause I got tattooed like maybe a year after her, but her first tattoo was a hand tattoo, but it was two dots. Like, um, mm. I'm, pu I'm holding up two of my index fingers and it's on the mm. side where mm -hmm. you can put, like, if you put your finger up to like, you know, your face, it looks like a mole. So oh, like the mustache just, that people would do? The mustache, yeah. yeah. But it would be a mustache. <laughs> like, oh, Marilyn Monroe. Or like, oh, you know, nice. what are some other mold people? But yeah. Right, yeah. right. Oh my gosh, They'll I have, love that. Maybe That's something so tiny. Great. Nobody will even notice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. There's okay. um about the witnessing piece. So I've, a group of us like collectively purchased this ethnographic piece on tattoos in the Southern Islands. And which is, I believe, the name of the book. Hilson, maybe you can correct me. I can't read this. Yeah, Minami Shima Irizumi Ko. It's like thoughts on thoughts on tattoos of the Southern Islands would be Thank my you very much. on the spot translation. Wow. Nicely done. I don't. I think I would have caved under the pressure. But, <laughs> um, but in this book, there's a whole chapter on like what is the ritual of uh, of Hajichi and my very unfortunate Google translations at this point have gleaned a few really nice pieces, but he talks about the, the witnessing that they do. So it was a, a group practice of only women, he says, but women would come while one individual is getting tattooed and they would all watch while she got her tattoos. And then afterwards they would put a, a little silk napkin over her hand and each woman would lift it up and remark on the tattoos. Oh my God. <laughs> Which, you know, how that. exact that is, is certainly open to question. Um, if anyone listening wants to correct me, please reach out. But I thought that was really sweet. 
<laughs> that's wonderful. That's cute. Yeah. That just sounds like you have that one friend who's just like super high, strong. It's like, yes, everybody <laughs> needs to admire my new <laughs> <laughs> You know, everybody <laughs> like. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like I instead of that. like the big rock on your engagement mm-hmm. ring or something. <laughs> right, right. Oh my gosh. The little bling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think one thing we've talked a lot about is kind of the ritual of tattoo, but something mm-hmm. I've seen the diaspora really kind of not cling on to, but be particularly interested in is the idea that Hajichi wasn't so ritualistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's like one quote that goes around online regularly about someone sharing that she and her, I'm not going to remember her name. I would have to Google it, but that she and her friends would just tattoo each other. And like this attempt to put so much significance and ritual on top of this practice is artificial and that that wasn't how she lived it. Uh, and from what I'm seeing, there are like significant islands where that was the case. Hilson, I think you know the island by island breakdown more. Are you able to speak to that at all? Yeah, I think so. Uh, everything that I've been speaking about is on Okinawa Honto, right? Like the main island. That's like where this document, a majority of this film, and, and like both Baku was from there and Kushisaku was from there. So this is like, you know, from uh, Naha and Shuri area, both of them. And so. That said, uh, the documentary, and there has been some work done on Outer Islands, and he, this documentary specifically shows um, Miyako, uh, which is where I lived for three years. And, and you know one thing I will say is I might just, this might just be something I'm implanting in my head. So I lived in Miyako for three three years, and if you're familiar, anyone that's familiar with Miyako, it's it's very different than Okinawa Honto. Um, geographically, it's very flat. It was traditionally... Um, it was heavily taxed by Shuri, um, and um, has a, in many different ways a lot of different. You know, the language is quite different, and and the tattooing is different. Um, the the hajichi, mm-hmm. and if you in this film, which I would say about a quarter of it is shot in in uh, Miyako, and they go to Ikemajima, which is a northern island above uh, Miyako. Very, you can drive to it though; it's just a bridge. Mm-hmm. The tattoos look quite different. If you're um, familiar with like the patterns on um that you see frequently oh i have uh well this is a terrible but you know uh, this is um like uh joyu mm-hmm. the the um i don't even know how you would describe these sort of cross um s- sort of simplistic more geometric shapes um that the is what you see checkerboard thank you yes yeah, something like that of that nature that's what you see and they tend to be kind of all over more up on the upper arms and things like that as well what what i thought was really interesting is that when the the women that are talking about this they talk about the significance of the tattoos being less tied to um perhaps life development and stages as marriage etc and more like um there's there's a quote that i'm I just off i'm trying to remember she says basically like ano yo ni ikanai like i i couldn't go to that world that place after i die so it's this idea there's this like connection with it mm-hmm. A more sort of spiritual, I guess you would say, into sort of, um, you know, and this is not an area that I'm, I'm really well versed, so I don't want to go too far off, but like the idea of connecting to the afterlife or, or like a way to, to, mm-hmm. to, to help you uh, progress through that. So it, it's kind of, a, I don't want to say ironic, but it's interesting. It's almost like this is, there's, they're pointing to where it'd be like something that helps you after you're, you're, mm-hmm. you've lived uh, versus um, perhaps something that while you're, while you're, while you're in the process of living, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's something I want to look into more. And I know what I was going to say is that I, I feel like, so I read, there's an area in Miyakojima, the Northern area, right before actually you get to, um, Ikima, it's called Karimata. And I taught at Karimata Shogaku or Karimata Elementary School. There was a total of maybe 40 kids in the, in the K through sixth grade. It was a very rural mm-hmm. area, wonderful area. Loved it so much. And there is a little, what we would call like a convenience store, a little market. And I remember seeing women, very old women um, in their eighties or nineties and I, and speaking and I, cause I didn't understand a thing they were saying, speaking, you know, uh, Miyako language. And I, and now that I think maybe I'm just imagining it, but seeing some of these tattoos on their hands or things like that way up there. And they would have been in the right, very last generation to have you know, of before everything got cracked down. So I, I wonder if it, mm, I don't know if that's anything, but maybe I just want to, mm-hmm. I want to remember seeing it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that. What year would that have been, roughly? Uh, let's see. I was there 2009 to 2012. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, and they were very small, very sweet, but very, very tiny, sort of <laughs> clearly had worked in the fields their whole life. So, you know, kind of have a, mm-hmm. a bat, some, some uh, spinal 
shaping. But uh, yeah, they were they were there and talking. Uh, they definitely were speaking Yanka language for sure. So it, mm-hmm. it, th- those are the places I think, and with language as well, it's it's in the more the more rural areas that these things tend to live on longer, right? Mm-hmm. Because one of the things with um, so there's a word called dolka, which is a, a policy that Japan implements for dol meaning the same and ka from bunka culture. So the idea of assimila- assimilation really, right? And these policies always start in metropolitan areas, right? You you start in in Naha or Shuri and 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 so a rural village on an outer island is not as heavily um, you know, controlled or or, or looked after than than somewhere in, in the main islands. Thank you for sharing that story. I love I love that visual of you you there. <laughs> yeah, she was like buying eggs or something, right? And I'm behind her with like a thing of tofu, like on my way home, and talking with the you know she you know grew, I have to imagine had lived like her whole life in the village, you know, like it was, um, yeah, and uh, you know those are the areas also in my experience living on Miyako, which is a very small island, like physically, right? It's, you could do the whole thing in an hour if you drive around it, or a little more than an hour. But the the um, even there, the uh, sort of variation between areas of the island, both in in language and and I, I, there would be stories where I'd be in the teacher's lounge, and in one part, of, like I'd be in this Kardimata area, and then someone could come in and they say, "Oh, I could pick up where he's from on the island just from a few words," hmm. and I'm like, "Well, this." It's like 10 miles away. So it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. He's from, uh, you know, he's from Ueno or he's from this area, like just from that. And, and uh, one thing I'd like to point out with this, this anecdote is that it's, you know, blow that up on a much larger scale within throughout all of Ryukyu, right? So, you know, um, all the Ryukyu islands. So things that existed in Shuri are, are probably much different than up, up north in Kunigami versus Miyako versus Yayama, et cetera. So it's difficult to try and, of course, capture every individual aspect, but it, it's also important to recognize the diversity that existed within Ryukyu because, um, well, it's, it's just a reality, you know? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. does anybody want to speak to, I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but just like the diversity and the actual tattoos themselves, just for our listeners, because I'm imagining, you know, there are people that are stumbling into this, not knowing anything about Hijichi, and we've kind of just dove right in and maybe they don't know much more than their hand tattoos. Um, but are there d- defining characteristics about particular shapes or um marks that um, would be defining to say some of those islands that you've just named? I have notes on a few of them um, and I'm happy to share them, but I'm also and more than happy for individuals to. I was gonna say, um, I'll send some scans that you can put in the show notes that right. might be helpful. Yeah, some photos yes. and things like that. Cause it always helps to see. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't Absolutely. translate well in the, uh, <laughs> in the audio <laughs> format. So I've heard the, the finger pieces referred to as either bamboo leaves or bamboo medicine uh, or just arrows more simply. Um, and then some islands have kind of like prongs that come off the bottom of them that this book I'm looking at now calls Hane. Um, yeah, that's what I've seen as well. Okinawa. Yeah, Okinawa Island doesn't have those prongs. So if you're looking at the images and you kind of see like, if you imagine it as a feather, what would be the air or an arrow as the feathers of an arrow? those little feathers would be hane, uh, and Okinawa Island doesn't have them. On Okinawa Island, the tattoos are pretty uniform. So if you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all. There is variation in like the number of dots that are on the back of a palm. And by dots, they're really like big all circles. And what I find particularly interesting is that those circles on the back of the hand and the uh, wrist, those are expanded at at later points in life. So it's I've seen 60 and 61 as the ages, but to kind of like wish for the health of your descendants in your 60s, which I love so much, <laughs> you increase the size of that piece. And in some places, they even like turn the whole back hand into kind of like a, a bigger black patch and like a fan image. So occasionally you'll see like this kind of full filled in black hand, even in Okinawa Honto, I've seen at least one from someone that said she was from Okinawa, heard that ritual called Tina. Again, not sure if it's accurate for either the design or the ritual itself being called Tina, but that's also been used for the later age ritual without specification in the 40s or late 30s rather than all the way in the 60s, depending on where you are. So Okinawa Honto, pretty uniform, 
thinner designs near Shuri from what I've seen. Like the lines are generally thinner, the dots on the knuckles are bigger. And then the more rural you get, and specifically around Idoman is where I've seen the most referenced. It's like the full area of the hand. So it's the same shape going down the line of the fingers and over the knuckles and the kind of five pointed star pattern on the wrist, but like it covers the whole wrist rather than being like a little thing over your um, wrist joint. Hmm. Okay, that's Okinawa Island. Does anyone have things they want to add to that? <laughs> oh, I'm just listening in rapt attention. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's fascinating. So okay. the 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 sun, right? Tida, um, there's like a circle. And that, that was one of the things that I've also encountered is that that's another thing that grows with you, right? And I think they also, in addition to it physically coming, I think, returning later on and, and having more ink applied eyes. So I, as you grow, right, as you grow into adulthood, right, like mm -hmm. it also just naturally sort of expands, like so the sun expands, right? Um, Ichijibushi is the five-pointed star that um, we'll, we'll have to include some visuals of this. That's that's one that you see very, very frequently is that is that five-pointed star. Um, this is one of the things that uh, that the this documentary that I, I keep talking about that he's trying to do is he's, he's clearly and there's been a lot of ethnographic work i also have come across a um 1987 so very shortly after this documentary that was i think it was yomitan yomitan is in central okinawa um a city or village at that time went around and they went to like every person they could find every woman and they could find in the village that had these tattoos interviewed them recreated their hands um, as a drawing, asked what they were mm -hmm. called when it was done. And um, you'll see oftentimes, um, presumably they were like circles when they started off on each, I don't know how you would, at the knuckle, the base mm -hmm. knuckle of the hand. So you have sort of five stars across. And then, yeah, this is something that um, the, the names I'm not as well versed in, admittedly, but the 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 sun, the the tida uh, is the Miyakan word for it as well, or the ichijibushi, which would be literally itsu, being the Japanese word. So like, mm -hmm. it's just the 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 shibanshu version with itsu uh, bushi and mm -hmm. is hoshi bushi hoshi uh, is the one that I see a lot. Oh, thank you for those technical explanations. We'll definitely make sure to get images to post in the show notes so that our listeners can follow along too. Um, I am, I'm curious, I, um, do we, do we know, I'm always like, who is going around and doing this? What's their relationship to Okinawa? Are these like Okinawan people mm -hmm. that are going around? I mean, I'm grateful. Like I, I do want to say that I'm super grateful that there, there is some sort of capturing of this going on, but I'm also always very curious around who actually is the one that's doing the capturing and, you know, the layers of translation and, you know, is it from Uchinaguchi to Japanese to English to like, you know, like that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So the book I've referenced a couple times, Thoughts on Tattoos of the Southern Islands, that one is a, a Japanese academic mm. of some sort. But then there's William Henry Furness from UPenn who wrote Life of Luchu Islands that has a whole section on Hajichi. Mm. Um, there's also, I don't know the author behind this one, but from the U.S. Naval Department from the 1940s has a whole piece as well mm. on Ryukyu or Luchu Islands that also goes into Hajichi practices, like when people and got them. The, the there was a photographer for. who worked like in the 50s in Okinawa from the base who took pictures. Is that from the book that you were, that last I book think this one about? is different. Hmm. I think okay. it's different because this one's not photo based. It's text okay. and there's a few illustrations as well. But Mariko kind of more directly, Blackie it's mostly me. outsiders that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I to, to 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 try and give the there's a, a lot of actually some of the stuff I have most of the stuff I've been dealing with has actually been, um, at least with heavily involvement from from the Okinawan community. So, mm -hmm. like, so this documentary, right? So, just to give a little history on this, is the the name of this filmmaker. His name is Kitamura Minao, and he's from I looked at him. I think he's from Niigata originally. But in the beginning of this documentary, what's interesting is that he talks about um, in the 60s, he first went to Okinawa to do work on a um, religious festival on Kume, the name of which is escaping me. It's quite famous, although it's-, it's Oh, it's I know not, what you're talking about. Um, he, he ended up being the last person to film it. Is that right? Yes, Before yes it's a it black and white film. Placed on hiatus? Yeah, because there's not enough women. Oh, is this Izaiho? Yeah, Izai, Izaiho. Izaiho? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so he films it. And he talks about, it's interesting, he, he's really not present in the film, except for in the first couple minutes. And it's his introduction of saying, basically, he says, I went, I made this film. And as I was making the film, I couldn't help but notice 
the tattoos. So mm. now, now being 1984, I decided that I wanted to go back, and this is perhaps the final chance that we'll have to document and talk to these women. That said, he's not, you know, many of these women, um, I mean, they, they presumably, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's a wide range, the degree to which how comfortable they are speaking Japanese, all but one, I think, speak in the interviews in, for the most part, using, uh, you know, Ichinaguchi or, or, or Okinawan language. And so those moments are translated into Japanese. And I should preface, I'm translating the Japanese, because I my <laughs> Chinuchi is, is not even there. So there could be mistakes, but I, I, I would say that it's not too bad because he has a whole team of local mm-hmm. historians and community members mm-hmm. that are, are are working with him. So uh, maybe, so I'm going to be in Okinawa in a couple of months. I'm going to be there for a cool. year and I'm going to be like trying to so cool. try and follow up and see. There, there, I'm sure there's some discrepancies, but I yeah, would imagine. Yeah, what you find. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would imagine that. It's, it's not too bad. And the other one thing I would say is, for example, I referenced that handbook or this like sort of ethnographic field report that the mm-hmm. city put on. That's definitely put on through them. And there are, I've also found little things like there's a, a book of minyo, which is um, folk songs, right? Yeah. Like uh, Japanese. And there's actually like one that is about hajichi. And what's really cool mm-hmm. is that in this documentary, oh gosh, yes. what's really cool is that in this documentary, one of the women, um, I think it's... Um, Oh gosh, what is her name? Um, Toyama Ushi, maybe is her name. She talks about it and she says, she sings it. She like from memory, like off the dome, he asks yeah. her uh, and she just like remembers it. And then I was yeah. like, oh, that's cool. And then like a couple months later, I found this book from Minya, which isn't too hard to find that book. And I found this, this entry on the Hajichi song and I compared it. It's like, she like remembers it. Well, I mean, I'm sure it changed from village to village, but she remembered the whole song. Like, I mean, it's not a long song. It's, it's only a few lines, but I was like, this is some, you know, this is like just another instance of it being like part of, of life, right? Mm-hmm. This song and, and um, yeah, she says, the longing for the first hajichi circles around my heart. From the night of the first tattooing, my wish is fulfilled and I am safe. Mm. Is the, so it's more like a poem, really. But that, wow. you know, presumably that collection of, I'm pretty sure that the, the uh, author that put all those minyo together was, was Okinawan as well. So there, it's there, but I think in terms of like, I haven't, I, Ko, it sounds like you found more than I have in terms of like dedicated sort of histories of, of Hajichi. It's always for me sort of like these, except for this documentary, like little things that are, are, are referenced to, and, and I'm working through that to try and, it's a spider web, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. I think the other difference too, is that I'm reading English pieces and like roughly Google translating what I can get my hands on with small references to Hajichi specifically in the ways I know how to translate it. So you have the skill and also the enormous investment of time that you've put into Okinawan literature mm-hmm. to find those resources in Japanese. I think that's, that's a big part of like why I've appreciated this conversation so much is that you're able to see pieces closer to home than I can access myself. Well, I'm trying. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoy it. I, you know, it's, it's something that I'm always learning something new and, and finding new things to look, find and, and help share. Isn't that such an interesting thing that just like the idea that there is a non Shimanchu who knows Japanese more and therefore has better access to Mm -hmm. to resources about Shimanchu topics and then us because we're diaspora because we're not we're not Japanese like we can't access them and it's such a struggle Mm -hmm. (laughs) like now I have to learn Japanese if I really want to dive in you know and another imperialist language rather than trying to learn Uchinaguchi and, and mm. like doing this my is, own research. a huge personal struggle for me as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, and it, it gets to what I was saying earlier, which is like, so often I'll hear people say like, well, I don't want that because it's not from where I want my information to come from. But like, there is just so mm-hmm. much wealth in the time and investment that people have put into learning these things. And also the fact that when you are attempting to decolonize a, a colonized history, it sometimes requires reading through various layers of interpretation and, and being, I would say, even a little less choosy about your sources. Mm-hmm. Um, eh, I don't know if I exactly want to say that. Let me like backpedal that a little bit. But, you okay. know, just like. <laughs> well, I think you're talking about like using that lens, deeper. whether it's like a decolonizing lens or just like critical thinking or just like yes. being able to like 
consume any like media or resources or anything and having Mm -hmm. the ability to be like, well, this is (laughs) actually, this goes back to something I wrote, noted down earlier, but um, just the idea that reading or consuming anything and knowing where it came from and how it's like, what the context of it is and what the biases are, which is why I kind of, I wrote down very angry, like there's no such thing as objectivity. (laughs) (laughs) Because <laughs> there really isn't like there's there, you have a subjective perspective on Shimanchu experiences from an outside outsider perspective, quote unquote mm-hmm. outsider, mm-hmm. as a yeah, non-Shimanchu, and that doesn't make you objective. That makes you have a different subjective experience than us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say we also have our own kind of like descendant of immigrants and mm-hmm. Americanized yeah. interpretation too, and I. You know, I like Instagram chat with a few like folks who might call themselves Hajichiya or people who are practicing Hajichi now and will like back and forth a bit. And there's a, a world of difference in our approaches for these things, how we learned about them, how they fit into our narratives and our, our family lives of like mm-hmm. getting Hajichi or talking about Hajichi. Um, so yeah, I think just remembering what we bring to the table when we are reading and learning and teaching ourselves is always important. Before I forget, though, this book that I've been talking about has its own song of Hajichi. It's like seven lines long. I think it's in Uchinaguchi, though. I think it's in um, just because the way it's written is all katakana with Romaji script. And throughout this book, whenever they're writing Uchinaguchi, he writes it in katakana and Romaji. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not translated into English despite that. But I will send it to you. Maybe you can make something of it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) See if it's the same song. Yeah. So like one thing is, is, you know, just to, to speak to, to what you were saying a moment ago about language, right? Like how I'd have to, you were saying like, I had to learn Japanese and I, instead of shim, uh, Uchinaguchi or Shimakotsuba or something like that. You know, one of the interesting things about the history of language in, in Okinawa is that generally speaking, right? You know, Okinawan language is not used in written sort of documents, right? Like it was either Chinese or Japanese, right? And and so there is this really interesting quality of Shimakotsuba as being one of of transfers through through oral you know and that that goes back to, to issues of like education and things like that that we don't need to dig into like in the Ryukyu times wow. right um like who is who is able to learn like who are the people that are able to learn to write in a, in any capacity and it's it's a it's a certain class of people it's not the ones mm-hmm. in the fields and if you're going to do that then you need to be able to engage with chinese diplomats and need to be engaged with japanese diplomats so there's a reason for for all of that um so much of the written history that we have of of okinawa and, and Ryukyu is and i'm sure there's people that are going to listen to this they're yelling at me um, um, that know more about Ryukyu than because I'm I'm modern, but much of it is is um is is Chinese and and in Japanese. But like just to, you were saying that you think without looking at it, you're probably right that he's probably transcribing the song in using like uh, katakana as. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is like Uchinaguchi, right? So that's how that's often why you see it in um like not you know uh, in in katakana or hiragana because it's it's like more of a transcription mm-hmm. of what is being heard. Right rather than like a sort of self-created when you're going to write something down. Um, mm-hmm. Although here at UH, we're working, there are language classes here that there's a, there's a professor here, Curry, that is working really cool, starting like learning Uchinaguchi without having to know Japanese. Because traditionally, it's always been like, you mm-hmm. have to have this knowledge of Japanese, mm-hmm. because even though they are different languages, they're really some very undeniable, like grammatical similarities. And it does help All those to- particles. Particles, mm-hmm. verb so stems. Particles. Um, verb stem sounds for the most part are very similar. And so mm-hmm. uh, anyways, what I would say is that there are efforts here in Hawaii because of the, the rich community, I think, to, to you know, interest to, to, to create a class to learn, um, to learn Uchinaguchi sort of from zero, right? Without having mm-hmm. to come into it. And, and that's new, I think just in the last year or two that, that they've started that here. So I hope it's, I hope it catches on and, and can expand uh, to that way, that way, uh, June, you can skip the whole Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so our favorite question on the podcast is what is your go-to karaoke song um so in no particular order as you feel called you can sing it you can just say it <laughs> but we would love to know <laughs> so i have to admit that this gave me so much anxiety because karaoke itself gives me anxiety <laughs> hearing about other people karaoke gives me anxiety really? i've done it in okinawa oh, no. but i have never done it outside of okinawa <laughs> But I do love Freddie Mercury, and I do feel that We Are the Champions is a great karaoke song. So yes. I'll give you that. 
<laughs> yes. And try not to make judgy faces because karaoke, <laughs> there should be no judgment in karaoke. No judgment. <laughs> judgment free zone. I love karaoke. There was a time in my life when I worked at a bar where I would go karaoke every single, every Sunday, like we would close the bar and go <laughs> off and do karaoke at this one bar. And yeah, I would sing my humps. Was my good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. I, <laughs> I grew out of that, but my current my current go to karaoke song is Alanis Morissette. What anything by her? Yes, <laughs> going back to my '90s roots, you know. Yes. Oh my god, <laughs> literally just singing her last night. Oh, I love her, <laughs> and so like great. not not like I mean, I'll sing like the classics. I'll sing mm-hmm. some ironic, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But so, some of her like weirder stuff from like. um Supposed to form an infatuation junkie. Like, mm. I, if someone has songs from that, I'll sing that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I have a sort of mixed relationship with karaoke. It's sometimes fun, <laughs> but sometimes it feels like a job. Um, I've had to go to like all these like work events where you like have to sing a song and, like, <laughs> and you sing front of people you that don't really so want to. Typical. No, no. Um, no. So yeah, I've learned, awful. I've learned that it's best to do one that everyone knows. Cause I did ones that I like mm-hmm. that no one in Japan knew. So, um, okay. So f- I'm from West Virginia. So very near and dear in my heart and that everyone in Japan knows for some reason it's like taught to them when they're like sung in the crib is country roads, um, mm-hmm. which I know yeah. like I could sing in my sleep and I love it, have a genuine aff- affection for it. So it's a very good one. Um, yeah. Country roads is my, my song. So uh, almost heaven. Nice. I love yeah. that. Yeah. That's so perfect. I sympathize with the work environment because I would be brought on to my sister's work meetings that were at a karaoke bar. Mm, and yeah. then not only was I like but needing to be impressive no. in general, yeah. it was also like, this is my sister's job. I'm gonna well, it's not even strangers. <laughs> it's like people you work with, but that you don't like really want to have those relationships. <laughs> you have yeah. to. That's like the nature of yeah. Japanese. Mm-hmm. Right? You have these big group companies or, or well, school meetings in my situation. And it's like, I don't Oof. really want to like Oof. deal with you outside of like 5 p.m but here we are um oh my gosh that's amazing well in 2022 taikai uchinachi i'm gonna plug that you can come you can sing if you want to singing optional but i hope you will come into the karaoke booth with us how how big was how big was black eyed peas over in okinawa do you think Oh, they probably know it, but they—they they, no one would know how to sing along with you, right? You want—you need something where you like, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, un- like un- get unknowingly you have a background vocal group with you. Mm-hmm. That's that's <laughs> yep. those are important. So pick songs like that has been my my uh, my what the lesson I've learned. See, that's that's my problem too, because the karaoke that I would go to regularly was like more punk and alternative karaoke. Mm-hmm. So like we would get people who would come in and sing like pop songs. I mean, I would sing pop songs all the time because they're ridiculous. My humps. <laughs> For example, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was kind of cool because like it was like that crowd where we would sing uh, Riot Girl songs together or like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever together. I need to learn yeah. some some Okinawan songs, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Begin's a good one. I think that was brought up earlier. There's lots yeah. of Begin songs. Yeah, Japanese are good. You know, pick a famous Japanese song here and you're, you're good, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Love it. Great. Well, I will, I think at this point, we'll just move right into our closing. I think we're closing really strong. I'm super Mm -hmm. psyched. We had a really great panel today. Um, And thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm just so thrilled. And I know that our listeners are going to really enjoy this, this one, this episode as well. So I'd love to be able to direct our listeners to find more information about you. So Ko, do you want to let us know where we might be able to find you either on Insta, Twitter, social media, websites? Um, Yeah. Absolutely. You can find Shimanchu Hajichi Revival on Instagram at Shimanchu Hajichi. And there's a link to the submission form if you want to share your own stories of either getting Hajichi or ancestral stories of Hajichi. There's also a link if you have resources that we didn't reference today that you'd like to share with us so that we can keep compiling those to be distributed back out to the community. And if you're not a social media person, you can email us at Hajichi Revival at gmail.com. Awesome. Thanks, Co. June, over to you. Well, uh, for links to my past and current projects, you can go to my website at jloatari.com. That's O-W-A-T-A-R-I. I also do tarot consultations and mentorships. 
And if you're in the San Diego area, I'm available for uh, massage and body work appointments if anybody's interested. You can follow me on social media, um, mostly on Mastodon at mastodon.design slash at Juni Juni June. Or you can find me on Instagram, which I barely check, also <laughs> at Juni Juni June. And that's J U N I E. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll make sure that that gets posted. And Hilson, how about you? Where can we find you and your work? Uh, yes. So uh, I have a Twitter. It's at Higehiru. That's H-I-G-E-H-I-R-U. And uh, I also have a website that's just hilsonreadpath.com that is latent for the most part. But I'm hoping to, uh, when I get to Okinawa, start uh, posting more, putting up cool things that I find in museums and archives. So um, right now, there's not a lot. There's a few translations of some songs from Japan and, and Okinawa and stuff like that. But hopefully to be more active there. Awesome. Thank you all three for being here with us today. This has been so amazing. All of the things that our wonderful guest panelists have said will be in our show notes. Um, so feel free to check those out. And so for closing, I'd love to just say goodbye to everyone. You can say mata yasai or thank you. And anyway. Thank you, Marco. Hi, thank thank you. you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for part one of episode three on Hajichi. I wasn't part of this conversation, but I learned so much and I just appreciated what everyone had to say. And I can't wait to learn more about Hajichi in part two. What did you all think? Do you have any Hajichi of your own? We would love to hear your personal connection and any thoughts you might have on Hajichi or this episode. Drop us a line on Instagram or send us an email. You can also suggest a topic via our submission form or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, a big ipe nife debiri to our guest speakers, Hilson, Cole, and June. Also, shout outs again to Brandon Ng for providing today's music. You can find him on Instagram at let's underscore sing underscore uchina gucci or on Bandcamp at brandonng.bandcamp.com. Thank you to Emma Nurie and to Joseph Kamiya for their audio editing skills. Thank you to those who have taken the time to rate us on Apple Podcasts and a big ipe nife de biru to Yuki K, Jason, and Bean who have donated to support this podcast on Kofi. Your generosity helps keep this dream podcast going. If you enjoyed our podcast, we'd appreciate it if you hit subscribe on our channels. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. And would love it if you shared with your friends and family. And of course, donations via Kofi are graciously appreciated. And for the Okinawan fun fact of the day. On the topic of Hajichi, have you heard of the Okinawan princess, the legend of Hajichi tattoos? This illustrated children's story is a wonderful combination of sharing family history as well as a retell of the OUQ myth of the creation of Hajichi. It's an empowering story of pushing back our normal beauty standards and to remember and reclaim the tradition of these hand tattoos. Another amazing thing about this story is that it's trilingual. It's told in Pidgin or Hawaii Creole and translated into Japanese and Uchinaguchi. Okinawan Princess was published in 2019 and was written by Lee Tonouchi and illustrated by Laura Kina, both who are Yonsei Uchinanchu. Maybe we might be able to get them on the podcast as guests in a future episode? Question mark. But for now, you can find this book online at bestpress.com. Link in the show notes. Thanks again for sticking with us to the end. Until next time, mata yasai!